songs and we trip her matches but we don't enjoy ourselves <laughs> to think that five and twenty years have elapsed since she was banished what could she have done to have deserved so terrible a punishment something awful she married a mortal <gasps> oh is it injudicious to marry a mortal injudicious it strikes at the root of the whole fairy system by our laws, the fairy who marries a mortal dies. But Iolanthe did not die. No, because your queen, who loved her with a surpassing love, commuted her sentence to penal servitude for life, on condition that she left her husband and never communicated with him again. And that sentence of penal servitude, she is now working out on her head at the bottom of that stream. Yes, but when I banished her, I gave her all the pleasant places of the earth to dwell in. I'm sure I never intended that she should go and live at the bottom of a stream. It makes me perfectly wretched to think of the discomfort she must have undergone. Think of the damp. And her chest was always delicate. <gasps> and the frogs. Oh. I never shall enjoy any peace of mind until I know why Iolanthe went to live among the frogs. Then why don't you summon her and ask her? Why? Because if I set eyes on her, I should forgive her at once. Well, then why not forgive her? Twenty-five years. That's a long time. Think how we loved her. Loved her? What was your love to mine? Why, she was invaluable to me. Who taught me to curl myself inside a buttercup? Iolanthe. Who taught me to swing upon a cobweb? Iolanthe. Who taught me to dive into a dewdrop, to nestle in a nutshell, to gamble upon gossamer? Iolanthe. She certainly did surprising things. <laughs> oh, give her back to us, great queen, for your sake, if not for ours. Oh, I should be strong, but I am weak. I should be marble, but I am clay. Her punishment has been heavier than I intended. I did not mean that she should go and live among the frogs. And, well, well, it shall be as you wish. 
It shall be as you wish. I left my husband by your royal command, but he does not even know of his father's existence. How old is he? Twenty-four. Twenty-four? No one to look at you would think you had a son of twenty-four. But that's one of the advantages of being immortal. We never grow old. Is he pretty? Oh, he's extremely pretty, but he's inclined to be stout. Oh. I see no objection to stoutness <laughs> in moderation. And what is he? He's an Arcadian shepherd, and he loves Phyllis, a ward in chancery. A, a mere shepherd, and he half a fairy? Oh, he's a fairy down to the waist. <laughs> but his legs are mortal. Dear, Dear me. me! I have no reason 
to suppose that I am more curious than other people, but I confess, I should like to see a person who is fairy down to the waist, but whose legs are mortal. <laughs> Nothing easier, for here he comes! <laughs> Good morrow, good mother. Good mother, good morrow. By some means or other, pray banish your sorrow. With joy beyond telling, my bosom is swelling. So joy in a measure expressive of pleasure. For I'm to be married today, today. Yes, I'm to be married today. Yes, he's to be married today. Then the Lord Chancellor has at last given his consent to your marriage to his beautiful Ward Phyllis. <laughs> Not he, indeed. To all my tearful prayers, he answers me. A shepherd lad is no fit helpmate for a ward of chancery. I stood in court, and there I sang him songs of Arcady with flagellant accompaniment. <laughs> in vain. At first he seemed amused, so did the bar. But quickly wearying of my song and pipe, he bade me get out. A servile usher then, in crumpled bands and rusty bombazine, led me, still singing, into Chancery Lane. I'll go no more. I'll marry her today and brave the upshot, be what it may. <laughs> but who are these? Oh, Strephon, rejoice with me. My queen has pardoned me. Pardoned you, mother. This is good news indeed. And these ladies are my beloved sisters. Your sisters? And they are my aunts. A pleasant piece of news for your bride on her wedding day. Hush, my bride knows nothing of my fairyhood. I dare not tell her lest it frighten her. She thinks me mortal and prefers me so. Your fairyhood doesn't seem to have done you much good. Oh, much good, my dear aunt. I assure you, it's the curse of my existence. What's the use of being half a fairy? My body can creep through a keyhole, but what's the good of that when my legs are left kicking behind? <laughs> I can make myself invisible down to the waist, but that's of no use when my legs remain exposed to view. Oh, my brain is a fairy brain, but from the waist downwards, I'm a gibbering idiot. <laughs> my upper half is immortal, but my lower half grows older every day and some day or other must die of old age. Oh, what's to become of my upper half when I've buried my lower half? I, I really don't know. Poor fellow. I see your difficulty, but with a fairy brain, you should seek an intellectual sphere of action. Let me see. I have a borrow to at my disposal. Would you like to go into Parliament? <gasps> a fairy member? That would be delightful. I'm afraid I should do no good there. You see, down to the waist, I'm a Tory of the most determined description. <laughs> but my legs are a pair of confounded radicals. And on a division, they'd be sure to take me into the wrong lobby. You see, they are two to one, which is a strong working majority. Don't let that distress you. You shall be returned as a liberal conservative. <laughs> and your legs shall be our peculiar care. I see your majesty does not do things by halves. No, we are fairies down to the feet. <laughs> Oh, 
lover, good lover, good morrow. I pray thee discover, still purchase or borrow some means of concealing the care you are feeling, and join in a measure expressive of pleasure. So we're to be married today, today. Yes, we're to be married today. Yes, we're to be married today, today. Yes, we're to be married today. My Phyllis, we will be made happy forever. Well, we are to be married. <laughs> it's the same thing. I suppose it is. <laughs> but, oh, Streffen, I tremble at the step I'm taking. I believe it is penal servitude for life to marry a ward of court without the Lord Chancellor's consent. I shall be of age in two years. Don't you think you could wait two years? Two years? Have you ever looked in the glass? No, never. Here, look at that and tell me if you think it's rational to expect me to wait two years. No. <laughs> You're quite right. It's asking too much. One must be reasonable. Uh, besides, who knows what can happen in two years? Why, you might fall in love with the Lord Chancellor himself by that time. Yes, he's a clean old gentleman. As it is, half the House of Lords are sighing at your feet. The House of Lords are certainly extremely attentive. <laughs> attentive? I should think they were. Why did five and twenty liberal peers come down to shoot over your grass plot last autumn? It couldn't have been the sparrows. Why did five and twenty conservative peers come down to fish in your pond? Don't tell me it was the goldfish. No, no, delays are dangerous. And if we are to marry, <clears throat> the sooner the better.
That's excellent, it has no kind of fault or flaw, and I, my lords, embody the law. The constitutional guardian, I have pretty young wards in chancery, all very agreeable girls, and none are over the age of 21. <laughs> a pleasant occupation for a rather susceptible chancellor. A pleasant occupation for a rather susceptible chancellor. 
But though the compliment implied inflates me with legitimate pride, it nevertheless can't be denied that it has its inconvenient side. For I'm not so old and not so plain, and I'm quite prepared to marry again. But there'd be the deuce to pay in the lords if I fell in love with one of my wards. <laughs> Which would rather tries my temper for I'm such a susceptible chancellor. Which rather tries his temper for he's such a susceptible chancellor. And everyone who'd marry a ward must come to me for my accord. And in my court I sit all day, giving agreeable girls away. <laughs> One for him, and one for he, and one for you, and one for he, and one for thou, and one for thee, but never, oh, never a one for me. Which is exasperating for a highly susceptible chancellor. Which is exasperating for a highly susceptible chancellor. Lords, to the business of the day. By all means. Phyllis, who is a ward of court, has so powerfully affected your lordships that you have appealed to me in a body to give her to whichever one of you she may think proper to select. <laughs> and a noble lord has gone to her cottage to request her immediate attendance. It would be idle to deny that I myself have the misfortune to be singularly attracted by this young person. My regard for her is rapidly undermining my constitution. Three months ago, I was a stout man. I need say no more. If I could reconcile it with my duty, I should unhesitatingly award her to myself, for I can conscientiously say that I know no man who is so well fitted to render her exceptionally happy. Yeah, yeah. But such an award would be open to misconstruction, and therefore, at whatever personal inconvenience, I waive my claim. My lord, I desire on the part of this house to express its sincere sympathies with your lordship's most painful position. I thank your lordships. The feelings of a lord chancellor who is in love with a ward of court are not to be envied. What is his position? Can he give his own consent to his own marriage with his own ward? Can he marry his own ward without his own consent? <laughs> and if he marries his own ward without his own consent, can he commit himself for contempt of his own court? <laughs> and if he commit himself for contempt of his own court, can he appear by counsel before himself to move for arrest of his own judgment? <laughs> ah, my lords, it is indeed painful to have to sit upon a wool sack which is stuffed with such thorns as these. My lords, I have great pleasure in announcing that I have succeeded in inducing the young person to present herself at the bar of this house. I plenty 
I'd grammar and spelling for two, and blood and behavior for twenty. Oh, Harrogen's lonely, it's true. I've grammar and spelling for two, of birth and position I twenty, with blood and behavior for twenty. of the house have diverged on every conceivable notion. All questions of party are merged in a frenzy of love and devotion. If you ask us distinctly to say what party we claim to belong to, we reply without doubt or delay the party we are singing this song to. Distinctly to say, we reply without doubt or delay. The party we claim to belong to is the party we're singing this song to. The party we claim to belong to is the party we're singing this song to. Thy heart is not 
Defy our definite command. Defy, young Strephon, mine this priceless treasure against the world. I claim my darling's hand. A shepherd, I. A shepherd, he. A market, die. A market, he. Betrothed are we. Betrothed are they. And mean to be espoused today. A shepherd, he. A market, he. A shepherd, I. A market, he. Betrothed is he. Betrothed is he. And mean to be espoused today. Neath this flow. Oh, we momentarily stagger In each part Draw a wee and ain't we Let's depart Dignified and stately Let's depart Dignified and stately 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 to offer for having disobeyed an order of the Court of Chancery. My lord, I know no courts of chancery. I go by nature's acts of Parliament. 
the bees, the breeze, the seas, the rooks, the brooks, the gales, the vales, the fountains and the mountains cry, you love this maiden, take her, we command you. Tis writ in heaven by the bright barbed dart which leaps forth into lauded light from each grim thundercloud. Even the rain pours forth her sad and sodden sympathy. When chordist nature bids me take my love, shall I say nay, but a certain chancellor forbids it? Sir, you are England's Lord High Chancellor, but are you chancellor of birds and trees, king of the winds and prince of thunderclouds? No. <laughs> it's a nice point. I don't know that I ever met it before. But my difficulty is that at present there's no evidence before the court that chorus nature has interested herself in the matter. No evidence? You have my word for it. I tell you, she bade me take my love. Ah, but my good sir, you mustn't tell us what she told you. It's not evidence. <laughs> now, an affidavit from a thunderstorm... <laughs> or a few words on oath from a heavy shower would meet with all the attention they deserve. And have you the heart to apply the prosaic rules of evidence to a case which bubbles over with poetical emotion? Distinctly. <laughs> I have always kept my duty strictly before my eyes, and it is to that fact that I owe my advancement to my present distinguished position. I went to the bar as a very young man, said I to myself, said I, I'll work on a new and original plan, said I to myself, said I, I'll never assume that a rogue or a thief is a gentleman worthy implicit belief, because his attorney has sent me a brief, said I to myself, said I. go into court, I will read my brief through, said I to myself, said I, and I'll never take work I'm unable to do, said I to myself, said I, my learned profession I'll never disgrace by taking a fee with a grin on my face when I haven't been there to attend to the case, said I to myself, said I. Never throw dust in a juryman's eye, said I to myself, said I. Or hoodwink a judge who is not overwise, said I to myself, said I. Or assume that the witness is summoned in force in exchequer, Queen's bench, common pleas, or divorce, have perjured themselves as a matter of course, said I to myself, said I. Other professions in which men engage, said I to myself, said I. The army, the navy, the church, and the stage, said I to myself, said I. Professional license if carried too far, your chance of promotion will certainly mar. And I fancy the rule might apply to the bar. Said I to myself, said I. Oh, Phyllis, Phyllis, to be taken from you just as I was on the point of making you my own. It is too much, it's too much. My son in tears and on his wedding day. Oh, my wedding day. Mother, weep with me, for the law has interposed between us, and the Lord Chancellor has separated us forever. The Lord Chancellor? Oh, if he did but know. If he did but know what? No matter. The Lord Chancellor has no power over you. Remember, you are half a fairy. You can defy him. 
down to the waist. <laughs> yes, but from the waist downwards, he can commit me to prison for years. Of what avail is it that my body is free if my legs are working out seven years penal servitude? True, but take heart. Our queen has promised you her special protection. I'll go to her and lay your peculiar case before her. My beloved mother, how can I repay the debt I owe you? <laughs> Recollect yourself, I pray, and be careful what you say, as the ancient Romans said, Festine ardente. For I really do not see how so young a girl could be the mother of a man of five and twenty. <laughs> Oh, 
upon her lap I lay with infant food she moistened in my clay and she withheld the succor she supplied by hunger quell your strep on my that refreshment be denied. Indeed, our strephid might have died. Well, that refreshment be denied. Indeed, our strephid might have died. But as she's not, his mother it appears. Why we? Heart on the necessary tears, and by what laws should we so joyously who rejoice because our Strephon didn't die? Oh, rather let us pipe our eyes because our Strephon did not die. That's very true, let's pipe our eyes, because our Strephon did not die. <laughs> Go to reach the one, forever we must part. To one of you, my lords, I gave my heart. Oh. Hear me, Phyllis. Oh, Rapture, there you leave me. Not a word you did deceive me. Hear me, Phyllis. You did deceive me. Not a word you did deceive, you did deceive her.
the lady of my love is coming talking to another. Oh, fire! A Streffin is a rogue. I tell her that he claims that the lady is my mother. Tell her, diddle, tell her, diddle, tall, long lay. She won't believe my statement and declares he must be parted. Because on a career of double dealing I have started. Then gives a hand to one of these and leaves me broken hearted. Tell her, diddle, tell her, diddle, tall, long lay. A cruel wants to separate two lovers from each other. Oh, fire! A Streffin's not a rogue. You've done him an injustice, for the lady is his mother. Tell a little, tell a little, tall, long day. That table perhaps may serve his turn as well as any other. I didn't see her face, but if they fondled one another. And she's but 17, I don't believe it was his mother. Tell a little, tell a little, tall, long day. I have often had a use of a thoroughbred excuse of the sudden which is English for repent, eh? But of all I ever heard, this is much the most absurd, for she's seventeen and he is five and twenty. Well, she's seventeen and he is only five and twenty. Oh, fine! A seven is a rogue! Now listen, pray to me, for this paradox will be carried no but here to contradicente. Her age upon the date of his birth was minus eight, if she's seventeen and he is five and twenty. She's seventeen and he is only five and twenty. Go away, madam, I should say, madam, you display, madam, shocking taste. It is rude, madam, to intrude, madam, with your brood, madam, brazen-faced. You come here, madam, interfere, madam, with a peer, madam, I am one. You're aware, madam, what you dare, madam, so take care, madam, and be gone. Let us say, madam, I should say, madam, they display, madam, shocking taste. It is rude, madam, to elude, madam, to your brood, madam, brazen-faced. We don't fear, madam, any peer, madam, but my dear, madam, this is one. Unknown, I ought to be more cherry. It seems that she's a fairy from Anderson's library, and I talk her for the proprietor of a lady's seminary. I took her for the proprietor of a lady's seminary. When next your house is to assemble, you may tremble. Our wrath, when gentlemen offend us, 
is tremendous. <laughs> And he shall wreak it. Oh, <laughs> 
A chap remains on sentry go to chase monotony. He exercises of his brains, that is, assuming that he's got any. <laughs> Though never nurtured in the lap of luxury, yet I admonish you. I am an intellectual chap and think of things that would astonish you. I often think it comical, fa la la la, fa la la la, how nature always does contrive, fa la 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 la, that every boy and every gal that's born into the world alive is either a little liberal or else a little conservative. Fa la la la, fa la la la, is either a little liberal or else a little conservative. Fa la la. <laughs> When in that house, MPs divide if they've a brain and cerebellum too. They've got to leave that brain outside and vote just as their leaders tell them to. But then the prospect of a lot of dull MPs in close proximity. All thinking for themselves is what no man can face with equanimity. Then let's rejoice with loud fa la fa la 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 fa la 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 that nature always does contrive fa la 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 that every boy and every gal that's born into the world alive is either a little liberal or else a little conservative. Fa la la la, fa la la la, is either a little liberal or else a little conservative. Fa la la. You seem a 
annoyed. Annoyed? I should think so. Why, this ridiculous protege of yours is playing the deuce with everything. Tonight is the second reading of his bill to throw the peerage open to competitive examination. <laughs> and he'll carry it, too. Carry it? Of course he will. He's a parliamentary Pickford. He carries everything. Yes, if you please. That's our fault. The deuce it is. Yes, we influence the members and compel them to vote just as he wishes them to. It's our system. It shortens the debates. <laughs> well, but think what it all means. I don't so much mind for myself, but with a house of peers with no grandfathers worth mentioning, the country must go to the dogs. I suppose it must. I don't want to say a word against brain. I have a great respect for brains. I often wish I had some myself. But with a house of peers composed exclusively of people of intellect, what's to become of the House of Commons? I never thought of that. This comes of women interfering in politics. It so happens that if there is an institution in Great Britain which is not susceptible of any improvement at all, it is the House of Peers. <laughs> When Britain really ruled the waves in good Queen Bess's time, the House of Peers made no pretense to intellectual eminence or scholarship sublime. Yet Britain won her proudest days in good Queen Bess's glorious days. Yet Britain won her proudest place in good Queen Bess's glorious days. Throughout the war Did nothing in particular And did it very well <laughs> Yet Britain set the world ablaze In good King George's glorious days Yet Britain set the world ablaze In good King George's glorious It's legislative hand. And noble statesmen do not itch To interfere with matters which They do not understand As bright will shine great Britain's rays As in King George's glorious days as bright will shine great Britain's rays as in King George's glorious days. combined with airy condescension, give me a British representative peer. 
Then, pray, stop this protégé of yours before it's too late. Think of the mischief you're doing. But we can't stop him now. Aren't they lovely? <laughs> oh, why did you go and defy us, you great geese? <laughs> In vain to us you plead. Don't go. Your prayers we do not heed. Don't go. It's true we sigh and don't suppose a tearful life or gift is shows. Fidelity to the laws you are bound to obey? Know ye not it is death to marry a mortal? Yes, but it's not death to wish to marry a mortal. If it were, you would have to execute us all. Oh, this is weakness. Subdue it. Oh, we know it's weakness, but the weakness is so strong. <laughs> we are not all as tough as you are. Tough? Do you suppose that I am insensible to the effects of manly beauty? Look at that man. <laughs> A perfect picture. Who are you, sir? Private Willis, B Company, First Grenadier Guards. You are a very fine fellow, sir. I am generally admired. <laughs> I can quite understand it. Now, here is a man whose physical attributes are simply godlike. <laughs> that man has the most extraordinary effect upon me. If I yielded to a natural impulse, I should fall down and worship that man. But I mortify this inclination, I wrestle with it, and it lies beneath my feet. That is how I treat my regard for that. Man. <laughs> oh, foolish faith, think you because is bravery my bosom falls. I'd disobey a fairy. I fly in the realms above, in tendency to fall in love. Resemble I the amorous dove. Resemble I the amorous dove. Oh. 
happy but I'm miserable don't suppose it's because I care for Streffin for I hate him no girl could care for a man who goes about with a mother considerably younger than himself Phyllis my darling Phyllis my own don't how dare you oh but perhaps you're the two noblemen I'm engaged to I am one of them I am the other. Oh, then, my darling, my own. Well, have you settled which it's to be? Not altogether. It's a difficult position. It would be hardly delicate to toss up. On the whole, we'd rather leave it to you. How can it possibly concern me? <laughs> You're both earls, you're both rich, and you're both plain. So we are. At least I am. So am I? No, no. Oh, I am indeed very plain. Well, well, perhaps you are. There's really nothing to choose between you. If one of you would forgo his title and distribute his estates among his Irish tenantry, why, then I should see a reason for accepting the other. Talala, are you prepared to make this sacrifice? No. Not even to oblige a lady? No, not even to oblige a lady. Then the only question is, which of us shall give way to the other? Perhaps, on the whole, she would be happier with me. I don't know. I may be wrong. No, I don't know that you are. I really believe she would. But the awkward part of the thing is, if you rob me of the girl of my heart, we must fight, and one of us must die. It's a family tradition I've sworn to respect. <laughs> it's a painful position, for I have a very strong regard for you, George. My dear Thomas. You are very dear to me, George. We were boys together. At least I was. <laughs> if I were to survive you, my whole existence would be hopelessly embittered. Then, my dear Thomas, you must not do it. I say it again and again. If it will have this effect on you, you must not do it. No, no. If one of us is to destroy the other, let it be me. No, no. Ah, yes. By our boyish friendship, I implore you. Well, well, be it so. 
What? No, no, I cannot consent to an act that would crush you with unavailing remorse. But it would not do so. <laughs> I should be very sad at first. No, <laughs> who would not be? But it would wear off. I like you very much, but not perhaps as much as you like me. <laughs> George, you are a noble fellow. But that tell-tale tear betrays you. No, George, you are very fond of me, and I cannot consent to give you a week's uneasiness on my account. But, dear Thomas, it would not last a week. <laughs> Remember, you lead the House of Lords. On your demise, I shall take your place. Oh, <laughs> Thomas, it would not last a day. <laughs> I do hope you are not going to fight about me, because it's really not worthwhile. Well, I don't believe it is. Nor I. The sacred ties of friendship are paramount. Though perhaps I may incur your blame, the things of you I would not do in friendship's name. And I may say I think the same Not even love should rank above True friendship's name Then free me, free me, mind the blame Forget your craze and go your ways In friendship's name In Friendship's name has yielded fortune, rank, and fame. What no one yet in the world so wide has yielded up a promise right. Except all oh, friendship, all the same. This side sacrifice to thy dear name, accept this sacrifice to thy dear name. Love unrequited robs me of my rest Love, hopeless love, my ardent soul encumbers Love, nightmare-like, lies heavy on my chest and weaves itself into my midnight slumbers. When you're lying awake with a dismal headache and repose is tabooed by anxiety, I conceive you may use any language you choose to indulge in without impropriety. For your brain is on fire, the bedclothes conspire of usual slumber to plunder you. First your counterpane goes and uncovers your toes, and your sheet slips demurely from under you. Then the blanketing tickles, you feel like mixed pickles, so terribly sharp is the pricking. And you're hot and you're cross, and you tumble and toss till there's nothing to explain. Doing the ticking. <laughs> 
Then the bedclothes all creep to the ground in a heap And you pick them all up in a tangle Next your pillow resigns and politely declines To remain at its usual angle Where you get some repose with the form of a doze With hot eyeballs and head ever aching But your slumbering teems with such horrible dreams That you'd very much better be waking For you dream you are crossing the channel And tossing about in a steamer from Harwich Which is something between a large bathing machine And a very small second class carriage and you're giving a treat, penny ice and cold meat to a party of friends and relations. They're a ravenous horde, and they all came on board at Sloan Square in South Kensington stations. And bound on that journey, you find your attorney who started that morning from Devon. He's a bit undersized, and you don't feel surprised when he tells you he's only 11. We are driving like mad with this singular lad. By the by, the ship's now a four-wheeler. And you're playing round games, and he calls you bad names when you tell him the ties pay the dealer. For this you can't stand, so you throw up your hand, and you find you're as cold as an icicle. In your shirt and your socks, the black silk with gold clocks, crossing Salisbury Plain on a bicycle. And he and the crew are on bicycles too, which they've somehow or other invested in. And he's telling the Tars all the particulars of a company he's interested in. It's a scheme of devices to get at low prices or goods from cough mixtures to cables, which tickled the sailors by treating retailers as though they were all vegetables. You get a good spadesman to plant a small tradesman, first take off his boots with a boot tree, and his legs will take root, and his fingers will shoot in the blossom and bud like a fruit tree. From the green grocery a tree you get grapes and green pea, cauliflower, pineapple and cranberries, while the pastry cook plant, every brand you will grant, apple puffs and three corners and banberries. The shares are a penny and never so many are taken by Rothschild and bearing. and just as a few are allotted to you, you will wake with a shudder despairing. You're a regular wreck with a crick in your neck and no wonder you snore for your head's on the floor and your needles and pins from your soles to your shins your flesh is a creep for your left legs to sleep and you crack in your toes and a fly on your nose it's a fluff in your lung and a feverish tongue and a fuzz that's intense in the general sense that you haven't been sleeping in clover but the darkness is past and it's daylight at last and the night has been long ditto ditto my son and thank goodness they're both of them over. We are much distressed to see your lordship in this condition. Ah, my lords, it is seldom that a Lord Chancellor has risen to envy the position of another, but I am free to confess that I would rather be two earls engaged to Phyllis than any other half-dozen noblemen upon the face of the globe. Yes, it's an enviable position, when you're the only one. Ah, yes, no doubt most enviable. At the same time, seeing you thus, we naturally say to ourselves, this is very sad. His lordship is constitutionally as blithe as a bird. He trills upon the bench like a thing of song and gladness. His series of judgments in F sharp, given andante in 6-8 time, are among the most remarkable effects ever produced in a court of chancery. He is, perhaps, the only living instance of a judge whose decrees have received the honor of a double encore. <laughs> How can we bring ourselves to do that which would deprive the court of chancery of one of its most attractive features? I feel the force of your remarks, but I am here in two capacities and they clash, my lords, they clash. I deeply grieve to say that in declining to entertain my last application to myself, I presume to address myself in terms which render it impossible for me ever to apply to myself again. <laughs> it was a most painful scene, my lords, most painful. This is what it is to have two capacities. Let us be thankful we are persons of no capacity whatever. <laughs> come, come, remember, you are a very just and kindly old gentleman, 
and you need have no hesitation in approaching yourself, so that you do so respectfully and with a proper show of deference. Do you really think so? I do. Well, I will nerve myself to another effort, and if that fails, I resign myself to my fate. <laughs> If you go in, you're sure to win. Yours will be the charming maid. Be your law, the ancient soul. Faint heart never won the lady. Never, never, never faint heart never won the lady. Every journey has an end when at the worst affairs will mend. your horse and don't say die. He who shies at such a price is not worth a mere lady. Be he so kind to bear in mind, faint hath never won the lady. None but the brave deserve the fair. I'll take heart and make a start, though I fear the prospect shady. Much I'd spend to gain my end. Faint heart never won fair lady. Never, never, never faint heart, never won the lady. Nothing venture, nothing win. Blood is thick, but water is thin. In for a penny, in for a pound. It's love that makes the world go round. Nothing venture, nothing win. Blood is thick, but water is thin. Make a start, though I fear the prospect shady. Much I'd spend to gain my end. Faint heart never won the lady. Never, never, never faint heart never won the lady. Nothing venture, nothing win. Blood is thick, but water is thin. In for a penny, in for a pound. Love that makes the world go round. Nothing venture, nothing win. Blood is thick, but heart is thin. In for a penny, in for a pound. It's love that makes the world go
that makes the world go I suppose one ought to enjoy oneself in Parliament when one leads both parties, as I do. But I'm miserable, poor broken-hearted fool that I am. Oh, Phyllis, Phyllis! Yes? Phyllis. <laughs> but I suppose I should say, my lady. I have not yet been informed which title your ladyship is pleased to select. I... I haven't quite decided. You see, I have no mother to advise me. No, I do. Yes, a young mother. Not very, a couple of centuries or so. Oh, she wears well. She does. She's a fairy. <clears throat> I beg your pardon? A what? Oh, I've no longer any reason to conceal the fact. She's a fairy. A fairy? Well, but... That would account for a good many things. Then I suppose you're a fairy. I'm half a fairy. Which half? <laughs> the upper half, down to the waistcoat. Dear me, there's nothing to show it. <laughs> Don't do that. <clears throat> but why didn't you tell me this before? I thought you would take a dislike to me. But as it's all off, you might as well know the truth. I'm only half a mortal. But I'd rather have half a mortal I do love than half a dozen I don't. No, I think not. Go to your half dozen. It's only two. <laughs> and I hate them. Please forgive me. I don't think I ought to. Besides, all sorts of difficulties will arise. You know, my grandmother looks quite as young as my mother. So do all my aunts. I quite understand. Whenever I see you kissing a very young lady, I shall know it's an elderly relative. You will? <laughs> then, Phyllis, I think we shall be very happy. We won't wait long. No, we might change our minds. We'll get married first. And change our minds afterwards? That's the usual course. <laughs> If we're weak enough to tarry ere we marry you and I, of the feelings I inspire, you may tie a by and by. For peers and flowing coffers press their offers, that is why. I am sure we should not tarry ere we marry you and I. If we're weak enough to tarry ere we marry you and I, with the more attractive maiden, jewel laden, you may fly. If by chance we should be parted, broken or hearted, I should die. So I think we will not tarry ere we marry you and I. Oh, oh if we're weak enough to tarry ere we marry you and I, of the feelings I admire, you will lay a by and by. Of the feelings I admire, you may lie a by and by. If we're weak enough to tarry ere we marry you and I, of the feelings I admire, you may lie a by and by. She is, and thus she welcomes her daughter-in-law. She kisses just like other people. But the Lord Chancellor. Oh, I forgot him. Mother, none can resist your fairy eloquence. 
You will go to him and plead for us. No, no, impossible. But our happiness, our very lives depend on our obtaining his consent. Oh, madam, you cannot refuse to do this. Oh, you know not what you ask. The Lord Chancellor is my husband. Your, your husband? husband? My husband and your father. Then our course is plain. On his learning that Strephon is his son, all objection to our marriage will be at once removed. No, he must never know. He believes me to have died childless, and dearly as I love him, I am bound under penalty of death not to undeceive him. Oh, but see, he oh. comes. Quick, my veil. Victory, victory. Success has crowned my efforts, and I may consider myself engaged to Phyllis. <laughs> At first, I wouldn't hear of it. It was out of the question. But I took heart. I pointed out to myself that I was no stranger to myself, <laughs> that in point of fact, I had been personally acquainted with myself for some years. <laughs> this had its effect. I admitted that I had watched my professional advancement with considerable interest, and I handsomely added that I yielded to no one in admiration for my private and professional virtues. This was a great point gained. I then endeavored to work upon my feelings, conceive my joy when I distinctly perceived a tear glistening in my own eye. Eventually, after a severe struggle with myself, I reluctantly, most reluctantly, consented. My lord, a suppliant at your feet, I kneel. Oh, listen to a mother's fond appeal. Hear me tonight, I come in urgent need. Tis for my son, young Strephon, that I plead.
It may not be, for so the fates decide. Learn thou that Phyllis is my promised bride. <laughs> It shall be so, those who would separate us woe betide. My dooms, thy lips have spoken, I plead in vain. Marchionesses, countesses, viscountesses, and a baronesses. <laughs> it's our fault. They couldn't help themselves. It seems they have helped themselves. <laughs> and pretty freely, too. You have all incurred death, but I can't slaughter the whole company. And yet, the law is clear. Every fairy must die who marries a mortal. Allow me, as an old equity draftsman, to make a suggestion. <laughs> the subtleties of the legal mind are equal to the emergency. The thing is really quite simple. The insertion of a single word will do it. Let it stand that every fairy shall die who don't marry a mortal. And there you are, out of your difficulty at once. We like your humor very well. Private Willis! <laughs> yes, to, to save my life, it is necessary that I marry at once. How would you like to be a fairy guardsman? Well, ma'am, 
I don't think much of the British soldier who wouldn't ill convenience himself to save a female in distress. You are a very brave fellow, sir. You're a fairy from this moment. <laughs> And you, my lords, how say you? Will you join our ranks? Well, now that the peers are to be recruited entirely from persons of intelligence, I really don't see what use we are down here. Do you, Tololum? None whatever. Good. Then away we go to Fairyland. Soon as we may, or send away, we'll commence our journey. Very happy are we, as you can see. Everyone is now a fairy. Every, 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 everyone is now. In the sky, ever so high, pleasures come in endless series. We will arrange happy exchange, house of peers for house of peers. Peers, 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 house of peers for house of peers. Up in the air, sky high, sky high, flee from what's in chance and I. We will be sure we have your fall in such a susceptible chance and love up in the air, sky high, sky high. Thank you.